Washington, D.C. school system, I believe is uh, Randy Weingarten and um, I'm not sure the name of the woman that runs the uh, Washington, D.C. school system. Michelle Reed. Could you comment about that, on that situation? I can't because, um, you know, I don't represent Washington, D.C. You know, I represent uh, this state here. But in very simple terms, I would say collaboration is a lot better than confrontation. That's one of the issues. Another question? Robin? Professor McCarthy, talked about kind of looming clouds ahead of us and Mayor Long talked about some legal battles and some ways he was able to negotiate uh, lower benefits. I was just wondering, each of your opinions, what the future looks like if there's not some kind of reform, if these budgetary numbers and a straight line analysis are becoming a larger and larger and larger piece of the budget. I mean, clearly 90% of our budget in 18 years can't be for benefits for the public. So I was just curious, um, the Washington, D.C. situation was one way that they're working around that situation. If they're, they're kind of playing games to get rid of teachers and figure out a way to make the numbers work. But in each of your opinions, I was curious what you think the future looks like if things remain the way they are right now. Well, I think we're going to see examples you know, across uh, the spectrum uh, coming back to the airline industry. As an example, uh, we've had labor leaders say to us in our research work that uh, they, in effect, had to take the uh, company into bankruptcy as the only way to get the changes. I mean, they had tried, but the rank and file was just not ready to give up the changes until, in a sense, they were in, in a sense, the glare light of, of bankruptcy. And then things got, in a sense, uh, worked down. I mean, right now, uh, airline pilots are working for half of what they used to work for. Uh, and they still have no trouble finding enough people to fly airplanes. Uh, that was, in a sense, an artifact of regulation, where the wages, in a sense, moved far above what the marketplace was uh, willing to support. Now, if you're a union member, you say, we should be above the marketplace. We shouldn't be just, in a sense, at the level of competition. In a sense, that's, that's the dilemma. So you need then, in a sense, to have extra productivity. You need, in a sense, to have better output and better quality to support, support the higher wages. But to go back to your question, we're going to see some convulsions, I'm sure, in the public sector. We're going to see, in a sense, uh, some municipalities, in a sense, going the route of bankruptcy. But that will send a shockwave around, and other people may say, hey, we don't want that coming here. We're going to have to start to work together. We're going to have to, in a sense, join the issue and not just let the status quo dominate. I think, I think that's well said. The only thing I would add to it is uh, cities and towns are going to have to begin to prioritize, and uh, nothing will be uh, off the table. Everything will be on. And if, and if you have that model, then it's going to come down to how do you apply that model, provide the services uh, that are absolutely essential. So the first one is the public safety. So I think you, you, you will begin to look, and that's the first reason everyone band together to begin with. You'll begin to look at the government has to provide public safety. Uh, after that, education or, or education in tandem with it. Uh, from that point on, we begin to prioritize and determine what does the government actually do and what do we rely on the private sector to do. Question. Um, thank you. Very, uh, I'm Bob Culver, and I would reveal that I was also a member of the Boston School Committee and its first establishment uh, as, a, as an elected body, and have spent hundreds of hours in the Union Hall in South Boston negotiating with Eddie Doherty in contracts. Um, Professor McCusey, I'm, I'm interested. It seems like we have been brought to the precipice this evening, whether one listens to <clears throat> good words of Tom or the mayor or the like, that we're in deep yoga, and, and you kind of want to say that. Um, it, and, and the issue is, if we're going to, if, if the economy is going to be down somewhere between 20 and 40 percent, and, and no one is willing to say that we're going we're to be there for a while, but I'll say that for whoever I am, I'm going to say that we're going to be there for a while, and a while means probably at least five years. How does one cause, and I, I would I ask you, Professor, but other than three can answer. 
there has to be some change in this, this overused word paradigm of how, in fact, organized labor works with management in the public to acknowledge that, first, we're in this situation, and secondly, this notion of mutually shared, if you will, acceptance of, of the management of the decline. And, and Scott, the good mayor, works with this all the time. And I just, I don't hear that language at all, Tom, I don't hear that language in the teacher. It's still as if we are in this industrial model that, you know, really you capitalists are hiding something from us and, you know, we're, we're, we're negotiating because we don't, you know, know everything we need to know and what we do won't have any real effect on the economy. Whereas now it, it does. And it, do you see, if you were to write an article now, would there be three things that have to change relative to the relationship between labor and management to deal with this crisis? Thank you. Yeah, sure. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think one of the advantages of the adjustment process in government is that government, as I said earlier, is not going to go away. And that the interests of government are very different than the interests of, of stockholders or, or capitalists who have a very short run in a sense orientation. I think the view of government is longer term, so that I think we have, in a sense, more opportunity to work these things forward. And it may take, in a sense, an incremental approach. Uh, I mean, for example, uh, the private sector has moved dramatically away from defined benefit pensions. Only 18% of the people now in the private sector have defined benefit uh, pensions. It's almost universal in the public sector. So there's gonna have to be, in a sense, a shift if we're going to begin to deal with the unfunded liabilities that are characteristic today of defined benefit uh, plans. But that's a union ship. That, that, that's a union ship. Well, take the issue of, of, of drug testing, which most private sector unions accept, where you have workers in high and sense sensitive situations. We've got unions in the public sector that are so resistant the public doesn't understand why people who are in uniform services won't accept drug testing. Uh, so they're going to, in a sense, have to be incremental shifts, subject by subject, aside from the big fiscal issues. Thank you, Bob. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, I was there at those negotiations, too. You know, you and I engaged in win-win negotiations. And at least for us, for those of us who were negotiating, it did come out win-win, did it not? Well, I'm still looking for paper performance. Yeah, <laughs> well, you didn't raise it at that time. <laughs> I did, sir. Uh, but it came out win-win in the end. We unanimously agreed, you know, on what we had agreed to. Um, and indeed, both you and I were part of that. Um, look, I don't know, quite frankly, you know, where all the answers are. <coughs> but I've been through implosion before. Prop two and a half was implosion. Everything that Scott Lang said tonight, I heard many mayors say back in 1981. Perhaps not quite the same urgency, but it was all there. What are we going to do? It was bad news for the cities and towns. If some of you uh, do not remember, Prop two and a half, and I could see looking at some of you, you weren't even born. But, uh, you know, that placed very severe restrictions on every city and town. Uh, the, the state economy began to take off, so the state increased dramatically the amount of local aid. The local aid that the states have gotten in recent times all came out of the disaster of Prop two and a half. The state redirected its priorities and decided we had to do a lot more in local aid. New York went bankrupt in 1975. President Ford said, drop dead. So the state, the city had to do something. I mean, we were all kinds of things. One of the things that the union did at that time, again, I can only speak for the teachers union, is uh, a lot of the pension funds they had control over, and they gave that to the city as a very, very significant loan. I don't know exactly what all the answers are here in 
in terms of the financial pressures, it is very, very difficult. Okay? And a lot of these will continue and can't be resolved at the local level. We will never resolve the health care issue at the local level. That will not happen. We've got to think in terms of a bigger picture. And that's really, really important. And I will address quickly the issue of pensions. Do you know that teachers now, any teacher who's hired now, funds her own pension? 11% of her salary goes to her pension. And since many teachers leave after five years, they never get to that stage, quite frankly. And we do have serious issues. I speak a lot on the health insurance. And people say to me, public employees have better health insurance than I do. I said, that shouldn't be. We should all have terrific health insurance. Let me, let me get some of these real quick. My feeling in this economy and the, and the long run revenue issue that we have now in the state. And I think the tax system is absolutely broken. So you, you know, if you really want to look at this, you have to look at a systemic approach on how you resolve this. And I'll, I'll finish this answer with, with just a few ideas on that. But the win-win right now is preserve jobs. I have not seen the union <coughs> lead in that on the local level. The unions are oblivious to the fact that they are, by the actions they're taking, by the bargaining efforts that they've made so far, they're causing their fellow union members to be laid off. And they're acting as if that is just part of the cycle, that's just a fact of life, and everyone's going to get over it. And in New Bedford, that has caused some, some very, very difficult situations for 180 families, and would have caused it for another 100, and I was unwilling to do that. So the win-win right now would be shared sacrifice, coming together, realizing that uh, this is something that uh, the, you know, the, the idea of brotherhood, sisterhood, needs to get people through with jobs. The other interesting thing that I have seen, and, and I expect the unions to lead on that, and I think they're going to have to soon, otherwise they're not going to be relevant in the discussion when uh, this, this uh, you know, all these bills come to be paid. The other thing is I don't see this, I've been doing this since 1978, I don't see this as a cycle. I see this as something much different than I've ever seen before. This is the canary in the mine. If you, again, the easy way to do it, and the, uh, God bless the 11%, it doesn't pay. A pension unless you figure X number of people are dropping out, we're going to earn 7 to 9% each year. Otherwise, it, it just doesn't do it. And if we're not earning 7 to 9%, 11% does not cut it. Uh, and also, with the benefits as, as loaded the way they are and continuing to go up, it won't cut it. A, a real pension is going to be dollar in, dollar out. Uh, reasonable uh, expectations of earnings. Otherwise, it won't work. It'll always be top heavy. And, and I'm uh, for a great pension. I'm for great health insurance. But if you can't pay for it, eventually the entire thing will teeter. The other thing I want to say is, I, I said before, uh, this idea of full employment. I wasn't being facetious, a wise guy, anything else. If the priorities of the cities, if you believe America's got to be strong at home, to be strong abroad, uh, we have a major problem right now, not just in New Bedford, Massachusetts, around the country. It means your priority is not Afghanistan, it's rebuilding America. Your pri priority is not uh, the, the blood and the money. Uh, the thing is that we, uh, we get, where Crystal needs troops in Afghanistan, I need police in New Bedford now. It's more important, fr quite frankly, to the citizens of the United States that we stabilize the city, stabilize the states, get the economy roaring again, get our uh, IT roaring again. Then we have a lot more to say about what goes on in the world other than sending our kids uh, walking along. So is national health insurance the, the, uh, the issue for New Bedford on health insurance? Of course it is. I'm also very concerned that Obama has squandered away a year worth of tremendous clout uh, on, on some issues. So these are, you know, to, to say, well, it's all New Bedford, let's talk about New Bedford. This is something, 48 states, two, uh, two outlying states, if we don't address these issues quickly, our kids, our grandkids, our great-grandkids aren't going to have the luxury of sitting here talking about it's like 1981. I mean, this is, this is far different, I think, this go-around than it's been before. Uh, and, I, and I think that it, it starts on the local level. But national priorities have to align with the local priorities. Let's correct one thing. I didn't say it was like 1981. I said we've had employees. <coughs> I understand, Tom. Okay. And I wasn't picking a fight. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to thank our, 
our three guests, but I also want to, before you, uh, I, I want to just have a, a final word here because this is something I feel very, very strongly about. Um, I, I lived through, as you know, uh, the collapse of Detroit. And the collapse of Detroit was due to the collapse of the auto industry, and to a great extent, the collapse of the auto industry was due to both uh, some very, very bad management by the people who ran the industry and by union leaders who followed some of the great union leaders of the past, like Walter Ruther and Doug Fraser. Uh, union leaders who followed them were blind to what was happening in the industry. And as a result, not only did the union suffer, the city of Detroit suffered. And it suffered more terribly than most other cities, and Flint, Michigan, along with them, and other cities like that. So that what happens in terms of industrial relations is more than just what happens to the workers in a union or what happens to uh, uh, the, their families. It affects everybody in the community, and that's why this issue is so important. Finally, when I was a young kid, we used to have a song that we used to sing all the time called Solidarity Forever. It was the anthem of the trade union movement in this country. And when we talked, when we sang that song in our home, the solidarity we talked about was not simply the solidarity of the members of our union. It was the solidarity of all workers, whether they were a member of the union or not. It was the solidarity of trying to put together policies and programs that would benefit everybody, whether they were a member of the UAW or not. Um, I fear that because unions have been on such a defensive, on such a defense, uh, defensive both in the private sector and the public sector, that that sense of solidarity of going way beyond just the membership is in jeopardy. And that we have uh, unions that often are blind to the broader issues we have. We also have mayors that are sometimes like that, not the one we have here tonight. But I think if, if we're going to get to the world that Bob McCursey talks about, or the win-win that Tom talks about, we're going to have to think very much more about solidarity in its broadest sense and what that means for every one of the cities and towns that we care so much about. And that's going to mean radical change in the way collective bargaining is done. It's going to mean radical change in some of the demands that labor makes. And it's also going to mean that if labor can begin to move to the table with those kinds of new approaches, I'm hoping that the public sector can move to the table with new ways to engage organized labor in ways that will not only support their own members, but make our city stronger and more prosperous for all. I want to thank Al Gosnell, Scott Lang, and Bob McCursey for being with us this evening for a marvelous discussion of these issues. Uh, have a wonderful Thanksgiving next Thursday. I hope you'll discuss